coming up on Nebraska Stories, rehabbing injured raptors and returning them to the wild, the repatriation of land to the Pawnees, and a sculptor reveals his vision for a statue of Willa Cather. Birds come in over the weekend or they come in in the evening. So the first thing we do in the morning is check those birds out. There's the ear. Betsy Finch has been rehabilitating raptors for 45 years. It must have been the tibia. OK. Tibia and still, every day is different. Pretty good. A little thin, but he, he okay. didn't eat for a while. Yeah. The thing that makes a raptor a raptor, and it comes from the Latin word to grasp or to seize, are the, the claws the large claws that are the killing instruments. They have a hooked beak. They have specialized eyes for finding their prey. I would like to see people really um, appreciate the raptors for what they are, for their intrinsic nature, and appreciate the role they play in the environment. Here we go, kiddo. Brooke Manis has been working and volunteering with Finch for the last five years. It's good to feel like I have a higher purpose in helping these birds, getting them back out into the wild. This junior bald eagle was found in northeast Nebraska with a severe case of fowl pox. His eye, one eye is completely closed. Unable to hunt or survive in the wild. You can't see to, um, to catch food. The prognosis is uncertain. The eagle is dangerously thin and may never see again. Not on the other foot. You ready, kiddo? But Finch has seen this before and has developed her own medicinal elixirs and ointments to treat an array of injuries. Up next, a checkup on two young Swainson hawks and the large flight pen. Here he comes. Look at that. That need to fatten up and build muscle. Time is running out for these two young raptors if they're going to be ready in time for migration. One of them was blown out of a nest, so he came in barely uh, before he fledged. And the other one, I think, came in shortly after he fledged. Um, we don't really know why he was thin. Even after 45 years, okay. Finch's face lights up. And here he comes again. When she sees one of her raptors taking flight. We like getting them off the free lunch program. Yes. That's good, because that means they're good. They're ready to go. In a smaller flight pen, it's release day for these three kestrels. There we go. She's number 74. Finch's husband, Doug, is retired these days and volunteers as needed. Capturing, moving, and treating raptors often requires at least two to three people. There you go, buddy. Good thing we don't speak Kestrel. And it's one last checkup for this great horned owl who got caught in a fishing line. Okay. So you are good to go, kid. There's a little thread of skin connecting all of it. It's only lunchtime at the nonprofit Raptor Conservation Alliance, located on Finch's acreage in Elmwood. And already, this is shaping up to be a typical Monday. A full slate of about 30 patients with several oh, new go. ones on the way. And we're just waiting for John to get here with 338. Hey, John. Oh. Hey, come on in. As the only raptor rehab facility in Nebraska, birds arrive from across the state, sometimes out of state, thanks to a network of volunteers who transport the injured birds of prey. This is actually their elbow. I don't feel anything. I wonder if he's just weak because he's so thin. thin. Bite, bite. A week later, and after months of rehabilitation, the young Swainson hawks are ready to join the migration. So we'll head on over there. Okay. As she does with all of the creatures in her care, 
Finch talks with the hawks. Right, yeah. Okay. She's been preparing them for this day. Go. The best part is releasing them back to the wild. They don't belong with us. They belong out there. And we're just kind of a, a way station to get them back on their feet. Hey, Tim, what'd you bring us today? We got a great horned owl in there. Let's see. Here. Back inside the trauma care unit, this great horned owl okay. is not looking good. It could be West Nile, too. She's very quick to assess. She can tell just by sometimes how a bird is standing or just, you know, in its posture, uh, uh, their body language. But the Here, prognosis is car, good for this peregrine falcon from the North Platte area. I wonder if that's a talon mark. Mm -hmm. Laceration there. It looks like there's little puncture marks mm -hmm. there. She probably doesn't want to fly right now because of the bruising. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the wing hurts. Her heart and soul are, are in this for the long run, you know? Every bird is, is an individual. What began as a volunteer project in 1976 has become her life's work. Over the past 45 years, we have, uh, we've handled almost 14,000 raptors, which makes us one of the biggest rehabilitation centers in the country. With nearly half a century of records and at least 500 new patients each year, Manus and the other volunteers maintain a detailed database of the raptors who come through here. She's been one of the best mentors I could ever ask for, really. She's so knowledgeable, and her experiences and stories that she has, it's, it's so awesome to hear them. Boy, we're going to have to get him out pretty quick. Yeah. It can take months to rehabilitate a bird. Half never recover and have to be euthanized. Others are no longer able to survive in the wild, but can live on as ambassadors. He's beautiful. He is, and he's beautiful. Yes. And look at those big yellow eyes. He sees you, Ellie. Holy cow, he's got big yellow eyes. Finch treated Orion about a decade ago. So Orion came to us because he was illegally gunshot out of a tree. Oh. And what's really kind of sad is Orion wasn't even a year old. Oh. <laughs> For those that can be rehabilitated, it takes a trained eye to know when a raptor is ready to be released. So. We'll come check on him in a little bit. Somebody might say, oh, that looks good, and I'm going to, uh, one wing is a little off. It, but it takes, it takes experience, again, to notice that. Just a little thin, but not Just bad. a little thin. After four and a half decades, Betsy Finch has been helping injured raptors perhaps longer than anyone else. She's the grand dame of, of raptors. She's like the Jane Goodall, because there aren't too many folks that have been doing this for as long as Betsy has. It is a grueling schedule. OK, we just slip it in. Up at first light to feed the hawks and the eagles. Hey, that's the first time they've left anything. Here. Making the rounds three times a day with food and water. Let's find out what's going on. Treating injuries. Yeah, I think it's going to be this one. Before finally Here. feeding the owls after dark. Are you going to come this way? Oh. As soon as you leave. In this cage, we have Alberta. She's our queen mum. She's probably fostered well over 100 babies. We are at DeSoto National Wildlife Refuge. Oh, hey. Don't bite. And this young one can hook up with all of the other eagles. They are a very social species and can learn more from the adults, especially on how to hunt. Look at that face, isn't that wonderful? And it is days like this one that make the 24-7 demand, the successes and the failures, worthwhile. You always have to maintain a certain level of humility when dealing with these birds because, uh, I mean, just in a split second, things can go from mediocre to bad really fast because they're so fast, they're so strong. That's the best part of what we do, it really is. I mean, this is a celebration. They're, that's why we're here. No. Okay. All right, kid, here we go. 
Should we count? Yeah. Three, two, one. Whoa! Look at that. Nice and strong. Oh yeah, I, I'm sure he'll stay around. There he goes. Even for Finch, these days are special. I guess I've been doing this for so long that it's just a part of me now, so I don't think much about it. I don't know what else to say, um, except that I feel a connection to him. I've done it many times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can really feel their spirit when you have them. You really can. While this young eagle couldn't be reunited with his family, after two months of rehab, he's regained his sight and has a second lease on life. Makes it worthwhile, oh absolutely. Everyone we can turn back to the wild is, is a celebration and a victory, really. Because without us or other rehabilitators, they, none of them would make it. All this preparation and it's over in five minutes, <laughs> really. It is, but that's okay. You know, that bird has the rest of its life to, um, to live now, free. The story goes that there were two stars. They called them the evening star, which was Venus, the female, and then the morning star, which was Mars. So when they get together, they uh, made the first Skeety, which was a girl. She was brought down here on a tornado. The first male was created by the sun and the moon. You know, and of course, you know, we all know when they get together, it's an eclipse. In 2017, members of the Pawnee Tribe of Oklahoma traveled to view the historic solar eclipse from land once owned by Nebraska folklorist and humorist Roger Welsh. There were 16 tents and, and camps down here, and we had ceremonies going on down at the river and ceremonies here and up on the hill um, in different ways of celebrating the eclipse. The Pawnee's visit to Nebraska that year capped a nearly four decade relationship with Welsh. Roger practically defined Nebraska for the nation. He presented more than 200 postcards from Nebraska as a correspondent for Charles Kuralt's CBS Sunday Morning in the 1980s and 1990s. In 2007, Roger and his wife Linda did what few descendants of European immigrants have ever done in the 500-year history of America. They returned their land to its original owners. Every means known to man was used to acquire Indian property during the growth of our nation. Uh, but Roger, despite that great links that the country went to to get our land by hook or crook, by force of arms, he undercut all of that by simply returning it back to the Pawnee people. Along all of the major uh, rivers in Nebraska, our village had permanent earth lodge villages where we grew mother corn uh, and, uh, and followed the herd three months in the summer and then a winter hunt. So that was a vast uh, indigenous uh, homeland that we had when the world was young. In the 1870s, pressures built for the Pawnees to leave Nebraska and move to Indian Territory, today known as Oklahoma. Our numbers are dwindling, diseases and stuff was, was taking place, you know, was, kind of starvation was starting to happen. So it was about survival. My great-great-grandparents um, walked down from Nebraska 
and, um, and that was Lotta's um, walking bear fancy eagle. She was forced to leave her um, father to die on the trail, and so she never um, had any love for Americans, <laughs> so she never learned English. When we came to Nebraska, it was a real, real, real time of depression, real time of depression for our folks here. And so we lost a lot of our ceremonies, a lot of our old folks. While the Pawnees struggled in their new home, settlers in Nebraska began unearthing the homes they had left behind. We had no sooner left than people started digging up our, our cemeteries up there and, and carting the remains off to uh, federal and state uh, universities and museums. We were told that, you know, their spirits can't rest and there was consequences. And we felt like uh, it was real imperative to get our ancestors back and then be at rest. In 1988, the Pawnees decided to act. They wrote to the Nebraska State Historical Society seeking the return of their relatives. I was one of the attorneys that were involved in negotiating with the Nebraska State Historical Society and, and to get our remains. Okay. It was on the board, the highest thing I'd ever aspired to. And the Pawnee, Winnebago, and Omaha came asking for their remains off the shelves. The Historical Society said no. At the present time, there is really a lack of protection for unmarked burials, and there is no protection for the or, or procedure for the proper treatment of Indian dead. Everybody on the face of this earth is allowed to be concerned about what happens to the remains of their ancestors, can be allowed to regard those remains with respect, veneration, or whatever it is they feel to put together appropriate ceremonies, except the indigenous population of this country. And the purpose of this bill is to correct that. Are we digging up any pioneers? Are we digging up anybody on the Oregon Trail to see what they died of? Um, what kind of things were they buried with? No, we weren't, and that idea was ridiculous too. The more rude, the other people got to be, and the more I saw this kicked me over the edge. He was an enemy at first, but what really shined was when he resigned off that board. That spoke volumes right there, you know, and we re realized, hey, you know, we do have an ally. Almost lost my job, the governor attacked me, the State Historical Society attacked me, the legislature attacked me, but I knew it was on the right side. Finally, after a bitter fight, in 1989, the Nebraska State Legislature became the first legislative body in America to pass a law to protect Native American graves and return remains to tribes. We go to the museums or the universities, and then we would go in into the rooms and look over the inventories, and lots of times we would go to the a storage facility. It makes you think when you see, when you have a little skull that big, you know, a child, and you have to put him down, you know, and they're usually in just little brown sacks or some kind of wrapping paper. Eventually, the Pawnees were able to regain thousands of their relatives from the storage vault of the Nebraska State Historical Society. But then they faced a new issue. Where would they bury them? The first time the, a contingent came out here to survey a place for the reburials, and I showed them all kinds of places down here, and it was easier then. Right now it's not easy to get to the river on this side, but we went down to the river, and here were distinguished celebrities, um, uh, leading men in the tribe, in suits, good clothes, and I had to stand there and watch them wade into the river, crying and pulling the water over their hair, drinking the water because it was their river. It's the Loop River, the Loop Pawnee River. It's Plenty Potatoes River. That was like a, a healing type deal because of that river, the you know, Loop River. That's where you know our ancestors lived all up and down that river. I got home that night and 
Linda and I looked at each other and said, you know, they're not visiting us on our place. We're visiting them on their place. And that sealed it. So we were gonna leave it to them in our will. And then they needed a place for reburials. And it was Linda's idea. She said, why don't we give it to them now? And that way, instead of missing all the fun, cause we're dead, <laughs> we can be here and, and celebrate with them all of these things. And boy, it, it's been that way. They retained a life estate, but the Pawnee Nation owns the property now, and that, that sort of led to um, a land return movement. We have made him an honorary member of the Pawnee. You know, gave him a, a Pawnee name. You know, Paritalka, that means white Pawnee. You know, and he and you know he he likes that name. But what would the rest of Danabrog's residents think about this? The Pawnee flag flies on Main Street. There's a new mural over here on the American Legion building, and while there's a picture of the Danes coming to America, there's also a picture of the Pawnee who were here before, and more and more the Pawnee have become an integral part of this community which means that the community has accepted them. But I think equally important is that the Pawnee have accepted this town. You know, it's, it's not just the land that's, you know, that we've received, you know, back. And it's the relationships, you know, that we've developed in doing that with Roger. And so many people who, who have, you know, been raised here or, or raised, you know, somewhere else and they go to Nebraska, and their Pawnee, they feel that connection, that very, very strong connection to the land and to the water. We really do have a strong desire to not only maintain the homeland ties, but to really look into what it would take to have a government presence in Nebraska again. I think that, uh, you know, if a person is wanting to heal, uh, historical injury or to bring about a reconciliation or a true atonement of, uh, of a painful past, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, our native people, it's all about the land. And there's nothing better that one can do than to return to land. Uh, I look at the maquette as a poem, and then I look at the forefoot version um, as a short story. And then uh, the seven foot, which will be in bronze of Willa in the in Statuary Hall, will be the novel. Red Cloud, Nebraska where people come from all over the world to experience the little town that Willa Cather brought to life in her novels. How absolutely wonderful it is to see everyone in their white shirts and their Sunday bests to come out and actually be seen, but also to see and experience the town life itself, how rich it is. I bet these people thought that this would only grow to another Chicago. 
This is an American society that's curious about the world. And things as interesting as a Ferris wheel is magic to children. And maybe this is a renaissance for this town to come back to its cultural hub, its heart. The house where Willa Cather lived as a child has been preserved just as it was in the late 19th century. I think visiting Red Cloud enriches me. There's no question about it. It slows everything down. And you start to really measure by inch everything. We're standing in her life, which is a novel, and I'm creating a sculpture of her and I want to capture the poetry. So it's really the essence of her, and yet it's as rich as, say, the chapters of a novel. For the artist, for me, it's a research for sure, but it's a research that I lovingly engage in. It's a fascinating journey. Thank you. She's lovely. Thank you. And, and she's going to be seven foot tall. Yes. Watch more Nebraska stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.